So let's, uh, yeah. Okay, so we are live. Welcome, Wyatt, uh, to the show. I, I'm really happy to, to have you here. Thank you so much for uh, uh, for joining me uh, today. So for those of you uh, who don't know, uh, Wyatt is a fourth-year PhD student at McMaster University. Um, as his website says, and as he'll probably tell us, his focus uh, in his research is on dynamics of many-body uh, quantum systems, uh, with particular focus on caustics, and which he'll, he'll hopefully tell us about uh, tonight, and uh, other types of universal uh, behavior. So welcome, Wyatt. All right. Uh, thanks, John. It's good to be here. <laughs> the logical approach. The logical approach, yeah. So... Um, one of the, uh, of course, you're, you're you're sort of this is your first time on the on the stream. Um, a really interesting thing to chat with people about is sort of like you know the human uh, the human interest aspect of uh, of physics. So um, I'm wondering, I I don't think we've ever even talked about this in private. Uh, what sort of led you into a passion for physics? Was there some type of transition in your life? Has science always been a passion for you since you were a kid? Uh. Uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. So for me, I was always I always kind of liked science uh, in elementary school and high school and stuff like that. And then in high school, I was into those. Uh, you know, I would I would go to the library and I would get those um, kind of pop sciencey books. Those uh, Brian Greene and Sean Carroll and oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Susskind yeah. They like you know those those ones and learning about quantum mechanics and 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 uh, string theory from a very i don't know the like i guess very storytelling point of view but it, you know this kind of exotic idea of physics being about black holes and, and really you know particle physics and all this crazy stuff that's going on uh, i always really liked reading those books and so i guess i kind of went through i mean i was good at math so i went through physics and in high school and was like okay i know i have to get through this like uh, you know these trolley problems to get to the the like the black hole stuff and then uh oh yeah okay i don't know i i uh i went you know i i actually ended up doing part of a, a music degree before switching into physics because i wasn't really sure what i wanted to do oh, that's really interesting but then uh, like as it turns out i didn't end up doing any of that like that stuff that I read in the books anyway, I'm doing like a little different, but it just, you know, <laughs> just kind of went along for the ride and so, ended up doing like condensed matter stuff, which was never something that I was like reading about, which is kind of funny. But. That, that's, that's, uh, that's really interesting. I, you know, I think, I think a lot of people have a very similar experience. You know, you, your first exposure to physics is popular physics in, uh, in high school, it's like black hole physics, cosmology, big bang stuff, and astrophysics and stuff like that. And it's so cool. Yeah. You're so, yeah. and you're convinced when you come into undergrad that that's what you're gonna end up in. So, yeah. what was, what did it look like when you decided to transition to more many body physics or condensed matter physics type questions? Like, what what uh, was that? Well, the catalyst for that was I was able to get a job in the summer. <laughs> okay. Yeah um and <laughs> I, I love that answer because a lot of people just sort of fall into the they're they're very fascinating questions that don't have a lot of popular science but people tend to fall oh. into them so i love that yeah. i love that answer i mean it was like basically um i honestly you know we had we had so i went to a small school st francis xavier and they only hire undergrads for research okay. unless you get a postdoc there um and so it only happens in the summertime, basically, unless you're doing your thesis. And then base, and then the the, the prof who 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 took me on, kind of advertised himself and was like, "Hey, this is what I do. You can get papers." And I was like, "All right, I'll do this." And we ended up doing. Um, I spent a few summers doing density functional theory, which is its own thing. That it's a really interesting area of physics and we talked about kind of 2d electrons and fermions and mostly two dimensions talking about the phases that they can uh, inhabit and you know that that was my 
uh, basically, the, yeah, that was where I came from is because this was offered to me. You can get a job doing this if you want. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And then when I came to do my master's, uh, I started working with Dr. Duncan O'Dell here. And I actually was going to be co-supervised with Dr. Itai Yavin. And he does high energy stuff. But okay. uh, he left like 15 days into my master's. And so I just was with oh. Duncan right away. And so we just kind of, I just kind of went along for the ride with that and was, you know, so I didn't so, have any aspirations to change. So, so was the plan then to go like to stay with high energy physics, to do these types of questions that you sort of arrived in undergrad uh, thinking you, you might be involved in and then sort of the supervisor leaving is what ma makes you stick with primarily Duncan's research or, or what, what was that like? No, I actually think I stopped being necessarily so single-mindedly focused on this, like, kind of, quote-unquote, cool physics, black holes, high-energy stuff. I don't know. I kind of stopped being so focused on that when I started doing other things, like like the the density functional theory, the DFT. Um, and then, so when I, when I came to Duncan and he kind of explained what he was doing in terms of this caustic stuff, I was like, yeah, let's do this. And if I get to do some uh high energy physics too that's fun too like i wasn't i didn't have this idea of what i wanted to do i think i was you know i came out of a uh, a very general undergrad i was very i was not uh very specialized and so i didn't know this is like i want to do this i just got had had this idea that because popular physics was popular and yeah you know kind of sexy in its own way mm -hmm. That's like, oh, that's the cool physics, right? That's what everyone does. And then you kind of get through it and you're like, oh, that's, there's so much more to this than, you know, what may be out in the public, right? So. Okay. That's, a, it, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Oh, Yule Fran says that's a, that's a really cool path. That's, that's definitely true. A lot of, uh, yeah, C coming in with such an open mind, uh, that's certainly not, I, I, I was like very hyper focused once I one, once right. I caught my teeth on something that I was interested in. I was very hyper focused, but it's definitely a really cool path to be sort of a not a free spirit because of course you're very focused now, but sort of falling into you know where you fit and then finding something that you that you really like. I, I think I think that's probably a cool segue as well. So so you you started with Duncan and then you ended up uh, liking it and you're talking about these quantum caustics. So why don't you uh, why don't you tell us what a quantum caustic is um, and, and why it's so interesting? Yeah, so I guess I mean uh, I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what your audience might be you know their background might be. So first of all, the caustic bit um, a caustic is a uh, it's it's best described in optics probably where you have these you can have really bright um, bright patches of, of uh, focusing of light. So a very, very common example, the classic example is the light at the bottom, the cusp at the bottom of your coffee cup. But there's tons of other examples like that, you know, look at the bottom of a swimming pool, you see these bright lines that are, that are uh, <clears throat> show up and it's, it's, you know, they're everywhere. They happen with, with light, but they also happen with, you know, any kind of, you know, propagating uh, thing basically uh, where things you know rays or trajectories can focus, and it comes from this this um, imperfect focusing. So, okay, uh, you know we have you know the reason why we have um, you know when we're doing s satellite TV or something like that we have a parabolic mirror is and that focuses at a point, but if you don't have perfect focusing, what you get are these um, special structures. Uh, they're actually called organized by catastrophe theory, this ma mathematical theory. Um, another beautiful but segue. These bright, yeah, another beautiful segue. <laughs> these, these bright patches are called caustics, and they're called that because you know they're very bright, so they they burn things, right? Yeah. But uh, they appear everywhere, and it just comes from imperfect focusing. And the quantum part of that is we're going to look for these things rather than being in light. We're going to look for it in quantum mechanics uh, because you know quantum mechanics. The quantum particles are waves and um you know they can have the wave nature and the, these types of costs can show, in a, show up in a lot of different spaces we look a lot in 
you know quasi particle spaces like like uh fox space as it's called or you know other you know like uh, just 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 not necessarily real space is the answer it's okay. it can be a little complicated in where we're looking for these things but so okay so that, that's all that's all uh that's all very fascinating what what does uh what does like a modern sort of uh accessible or, or can, can you explain it in an accessible way what like a modern research question might look like uh in, in this in this field yeah okay i mean so in this this field is pretty um I guess pretty narrow is that there's not a lot of people who do this specifically. So there's not a lot of people we can talk to about it. There are some like, uh, you know, Ulf Leinhardt is a very famous example. He kind of came up with the word or the, the phrase quantum catastrophe. Yeah. And <clears throat> he um, he's talking about Hawking radiation and, 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 you know, accelerating reference frames. But mm -hmm. basically when we're looking at the, these, these types of systems, we're saying, okay, I know that this structure has to exist for some reason because, so we have this idea of universality in that um, if there's focusing that's occurring, you, basically these structures are going to show up. Okay. Yeah. And so they're universal. Then we say, okay, what, because I know these structures show up, what properties are inherited by these? This, the, the, by the fact that I know these structures exist. So, I see. so, um, so Michael Berry and uh, John Nye in the seventies and eighties did a lot of work on optics and these catastrophe theory and the, with wave catastrophes. And they showed all these kinds of properties that show up in waves and how you can create these things and uh, you know, play around with them, but also what properties show up with them uh, when you do things like you change the wavelength or you change the energy or you change the shape of the lens. And it turns out there's things like scaling exponents that are unique to the catastrophes, which are inherited by uh, the caustics themselves. And so let's say I wanted to look at, a, you know, uh, an electron that was like being focused and had some kind of structure, then I could change maybe its, its wavelength. So changing its momentum or its energy. And then there's there, there's uh, diffraction patterns and special special things that will, as I tune certain parameters, you'll always see them change in the same way. And, or it'll get brighter for some reason and it'll, it'll scale in some way. And so it's questions like that, like, okay, now that I know that, you know, the caustic is happening at, these properties are inherited. How does that change my experiments, or can I measure these things? Okay, that's uh, that's that's really interesting. Uh, uh, Alejandro is asking, um, could you explain what a quantum catastrophe is? Which I guess is yeah, it's a great segue <laughs> to sort of uh, keep keep going here. So. Yeah, so it sounds a lot more dramatic than it is. <laughs> that's that's one of that's um, one of the things about research, guys, is that so, sometimes people. I mean, it's fun to give your uh, your your research very very dramatic uh, names because it gathers uh, sort of interest. But so uh, yeah. okay, so there's a couple things there. So when you, when you if you were to Google quantum catastrophe, you would probably I don't know if you would even get my name, but you would probably get the ultraviolet catastrophe. Maybe and maybe the orthogonality catastrophe, which is its own interesting thing. But okay, so my our version of what a quantum catastrophe is that it is a quantized version of a mathematical thing called a catastrophe. And a catastrophe is one of these special structures that appear. Um, they're what they are are they're stable bifurcations if we're going to get very mathy and they're they're bifurcations that are stable under perturbation and uh generic so a, a classic bifurcation is the um pitchfork but the pitchfork is unstable uh if you uh, i don't want to get too into the math but if you if you it comes from 
this cubic equation, and if you perturb it, then the pitchfork breaks. Uh, but per okay. that whole way that it's broken is organized by this thing called the, uh, a, a cusp catastrophe. And, um, and, 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 and basically how it, this thing can govern how dynamical systems evolve it, under very small changes, how they can behave very differently. And so it, ours is just the quantum version of that. I don't know if I explained that very well at all. But. So, so I think I think an interesting question to ask then. So, so what? So Wyatt and I are actually writing a paper together uh, right now, um, in which I believe you use catastrophe theory uh, to prove one of the main analytical arguments. Uh, can you sort of elaborate, like, what kind of what kind of tools does catastrophe theory give you uh, when you're working on uh, certain types of problems, and what and what type of problems does it help you uh, help you look at? Right. So, okay, so one of the most important parts of catastrophe theory ultimately is something called Tom's uh, Tom's theorem, which is <clears throat> basically says that if you have any function um, that has coalescing stationary points, um, so if you've got like a cubic and let's say you can turn the knob and the cubic has two critical points, as you turn the knob, these things come together and annihilate. If you have any function that has that behavior, <laughs> Wait, sorry, what There's... do you mean by a critical point in this context? Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> stationary point, I guess, I okay. should say. Stationary point, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Critical, uh, that's the math language coming out. Yeah. Um, there's rules, there's basically rules about uh, the local neighbor, the behavior of that function in a local neighborhood. And you can get into the details of that, but what I'm, what ultimately ends up happening is basically I can... What you could do with it is just say, ah, I can look at the fundamental underlying equations and say, there's stationary points that are coalescing. That means near that coalescing coalescence, I can locally describe it as one of these catastrophes. And you've just got a list of functions and you look up, okay, I've got two coalescing points in two dimensions, it's this one. And then you kind of stick that in and say, that's the local behavior of this function. As it turns out, that's very useful because those stationary points, if they, if that function is an action, then all of a sudden, okay, action, these stationary points are trajectories, right? Okay. Like action now, in the sense of classical, like a little garage. Yeah, in terms of a classical mechanical action, or if you're talking okay. about optics, then it's a optical path then the the solutions to a stationary the, well the stationary action are classical solutions and where they're coalescing that's a focusing of trajectories and so even so when you talk about quantum mechanics we often talk about we can we can kind of view it from a a different language in terms of like instead of a wave function we've got like a like a ton of trajectories each of them um, uh, contributing to some wave function in some way. And this is Feynman's idea of, you know, well, the Feynman path integral, you know, you've got a bunch of paths and the particle can take all the paths and, 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 but it turns out where those paths focus, well, that's the same story as the optical path. And so okay. you can use catastrophe theory to locally be locally describe basically a, uh, the path integral near these near these coalescing points, and it turns out in our case that when we talk about um, uh, our our caustic showing up, that's where that's where you're getting coalescing stationary points, and so you're taking you're taking kind of Feynman's path integral idea, and then um, this this coalescing station coalescing stationary points from catastrophe theory and kind of putting them together. And that that was whole that was Michael Berry's whole thing, but with from an optics point of view in the seventies and eighties. Okay. Along with John Nye, who was also brilliant. It's very uh that's very interesting. So what what motivates the um the name catastrophe then? Like what 
Like, what? What is? Is there a singular uh, yeah, thing in that description is, that is a catastrophe? Like, is there is there something that is a catastrophe in that? Like, when I'm tuning that cubic function, for example, is there something that is a catastrophe there? Yeah. Well, the the idea is that like, what it's what it is ultimately doing is it's 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 describing behavior that suddenly changes even though you've only turned the knob a tiny tiny bit an infinitesimal amount okay right so there's there's um these things called catastrophe machines which uh renee i think renee tom or no zeman zeman invented them and it's like this this thing it's like a little little disc with a, a rubber and attached to it and the idea is if you could, it's kind of stable and then if you just turn the the disc a tiny tiny bit all of a sudden it flips okay. and so if you want to look dis, if you want to describe the dynamics of this thing it's it's incredibly unstable around this point and and it's it's near this point that the the, the catastrophe is happening the catastrophe and it's just the fact that usually we think that if i turn a knob a little bit I shouldn't get insanely different behaviors on either side of this. I see this. This bifurcation is what it is, um, but that's what's happening. And so, this, this catastrophe was born out of language, basically. But it's the mathematicians who came up with that language. I see. Okay. Okay. That, that's uh, that's really that's really interesting. Um, okay. So Yule uh, has a question for us. Uh, how do you feel when you try to explain your work to non-physics friends? Sometimes even non-mathy friends. So uh, I guess if if you're fine with that, I'll go. Yeah, I'll go, go first. On. So, um, so for for me, sometimes this can be very difficult, and, and it's really like a process. Every single time, it, one thing about me is that I don't necessarily expect people to be um, interested per se in my research. So I'm always sort of taken off guard when people ask me. Uh, for more details than sort of like the the basic spiel I give people is that I work on like material science essentially and then usually yeah. they leave it um, at that and then um, as soon as they sort of probe past that sometimes it's been sort of like a process of learning you know how do you explain eigenstate thermalization uh, to people um, so I try to uh, originally, I I would go into like you know what is an eigenstate, what is an eigenvector <laughs> of a matrix, what is a matrix, and so, so sooner sooner or later you sort of dig yourself a hole and no one knows what's going on, um, and people just nod along, of course, and let you say your spiel. So then I so then I try to focus on um, the the thing that I I find that's uh, successful now now that I've learned more and more is that uh, you sort of ask them like you know interesting questions about like i'm really interested or you say something like i'm really interested in why um temperature tells you so much about our everyday life and why sort of like these physics equations that people have like quantum mechanics and all the goofiness you get in quantum mechanics and you can tell them about like stern gerlach experiment double slit experiment heisenberg's uncertainty principle and things like that and sort of like you know i have all this goofiness going on and then once you get up uh, in the morning, for some reason, you're checking the TV and you're looking at like, <laughs> what's the temperature today? And somehow that one singular number tells you so much. Um, and that yeah. and that usually becomes an interesting uh, thing to tell them. Another thing to tell them is, um, uh, is like, you know, I have all these colleagues who are working on these really cool things like superconductors or, you know, describing insulators and, you know, uh, the condensed matter community has been so successful inventing different type of like you know uh, perhaps this is uh you know like a lot a lot of the technology that you see has first passed through the condensed matter community because like materials need to be like classified and understood um first so like you know we're sort of the stepping stone and then you know then you pass it along and people find that very interesting as well and you'll says because when you get deep into foundational physics things get impossible to explain uh, yeah i guess i guess the moral of the story is i try i used to try to understand uh tr try to explain those things but now i sort of avoid them and try to motivate 
interesting questions that would be fun to solve and, and fun to understand. What, 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 what do you yeah. think, Wyatt? Yeah, I mean, it's a good, really good question. And it's, it's, it's something I ask other people all the time, because I'm like, I like, how do you like some people? So, so some people for sure have it easier than others. And I think yeah. you probably have a very difficult one because this <laughs> I can show pretty pictures with mine. Like basically <laughs> my go to is I grab like I, I literally grab a coffee cup and I'm like, look at this thing. And then I, I start I'm like, this occurs because lights doing, you know, lights focusing, but it's focusing imperfectly. And then you get into you can talk about, okay, well, light isn't just, you know, ray trajectories, it's actually waves. And guess what else is a wave? Particles, but they also have trajectories. And then, you know, you can you can talk about that. It, it takes a long time to like get good at that. <laughs> and it does, yeah. every time you try, it's different. And then you're like, I messed this up. Uh, like... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but there's certainly, there's benefits to like, for me, I think there's benefits in that I can sometimes use props and like getting good at just like be, like drawing things on a piece of paper, like, oh, yeah. just like, look at this, like this can, and, and, you know, it's, it's like, even now I found, I find like describing my research more difficult without just like, just doing it by, by like telling you. And telling the audience rather than being like having a like a whiteboard behind me which would have been maybe smarter but um yeah it's 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 tough and i, I can't imagine what it is for you because like i can stay to thermalization hypothesis like oh yeah like what does that mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah like what are the moving parts in that like why do we even like why yeah, like, do why do we even care right um you ever heard of an, an out of time order correlator <laughs> 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 yeah, they're on the Reddit thread today, uh, or I guess yesterday, someone asked, like, can you explain scrambling in more layman's terms? And, and I wrote something down that was like, you know, you're sort of like hiding information non-locally and things sort of get spread out so much. Um, yeah. Conservation of information is easy because it's just sort of like I can I can retrace my steps or I can say what's going to happen in the future. But um, scrambling is like when I when I wrote that answer, I was like, you know what? I wouldn't like if I was this person, uh, I wouldn't accept this answer because like, what is, what is information then? Like, why, why is it being hidden? Like, where is it? You know, what yeah. is it? Um, it's not a very satisfactory. I don't, I actually don't have a good, I don't have a good explanation for what scrambling is, as you can probably see by the video in terms of something that's not mathematical. I, I really think of the, uh, I really think of that phenomena mathematically the, yep. the the nice thing about eigenstate thermalization is that at the very at, like it took me li listen it took me like a year to get to the point where i was actually <laughs> explaining it by not actually addressing what eth was right um but it's just sort of like you know what's the you find the wonder in the fact that our macroscopic universe is so um yeah so, so trivial so i just sort of like i guess i zoom out and say you know why does stat mac and thermal work and i don't even say what stat mac and thermal are i'm just like temperature yeah. pressure volume macroscopic think, things yeah there's there's often i mean it also really depends on your audience too like like yeah. like your your audience here is kind of generally you know not necessarily into specifically thermalization and scrambling and or even just stat mac right it's 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 starting from a a physics background is entirely different from someone yes someone off the street who doesn't have a background you can go in and be like oh do you have a like a general science background and like where from where can i go oh you've got like a you know you remember this from you know like if i can draw anything from are we good? Yeah, I guess so. I, yeah, I don't think I don't think you dropped off oh, at all. Okay, I froze for a second there, but yeah, you keep you keep freezing, but your voice is coming through kind of clearly okay. for me. I don't know if people in the chat are having a similar experience, but I imagine okay. they are. I see. I don't remember where I was going with that. But, uh, <laughs> I think it, yeah. So like, I don't think I could draw on anything bio from biology, for example, because I don't have. 
yeah that background to be like this is where you could see it coming through but you know there's some there's you kind of have to probe your audience first too and that, that's I fine that sometimes it's easier than others you know yeah, so sometimes it's fun to have conversations with people who have, like, just a math background. Because so I can be like, okay, so you have these matrices, right? <laughs> and then we construct our Hilbert space in this, like, local way. Um, and then you go yeah. through the chat that way. But uh, Alejandro says, uh, <laughs> thermalization, at least... No, uh, you can't do that, You're, but pretend you can. <laughs> what, what's that? What's that, what? Or maybe maybe we lost... Sorry, there was some... Uh... Yeah, there's a little bit of okay. Get, go go to go to the thing. <laughs> wait, wait, sorry, what? Sorry. Oh, okay, okay. No, sorry. What? Got, what could? What can't? Got I got choppy do? there. What? Uh, what can't? I, I was do? saying that the math, the mathematician would tell you what you can and can't do. They'd be like, Oh, oh I see. This. I see. I see. You're not being rigorous this isn't enough. Bounded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alejandro says thermalization. At least I would explain it as why do you not see quantum effects in the real world, and then tell them that temperature destroys most quantum effects. That is absolutely yeah. That's it. That's a good way to explain it. Um, yeah, the you know sort of the thermal fluctuations. The, the things just sort of become classical because there's just so much stuff. Um, yeah. Which is which is a yeah. That's a really good. Uh, it's a really good way to sort of explain it to someone who, yeah, doesn't uh, doesn't have too much of a background. It's a good way to summarize it. Um, that was yeah, that was that was definitely a really a really interesting question. It's such a journey because you're so because sometimes you're asked it when you're like brand new to a project and you're sort of like wrapping your head around why more technical people are interested in this problem so passionately right like i'm i'm starting a new project uh with my supervisor on on sort of quantum phase transitions and and things like that um and for the particular model we're looking at yes i have a vague understanding of why we're interested in these things but i certainly couldn't explain it um to to a random stranger uh on the street so like when yeah. you're a, when you're a fresh master's student it's sort of hard to justify to like your family for example like why why is your research interesting like what are you actually yeah. doing that i mean that comes with the uh, yeah that certainly comes with with getting more and more familiar with the topic and like my your intuition gets better and so you get better at understanding why people might care about this and i remember giving talks like giving my like prelim talks or whatever when I was a master's student and I just like think back to them I'm like oh those were so bad like <laughs> like I, I did not communicate that at all right oh uh, I <laughs> like maybe technically correct but not good talk right yeah I gave some talks in undergrad about my first uh my first paper with Marcus Mueller and I was just because the thing that I actually did was all of these technical details I took them through how to solve the XX model. I took them through all the, you know, how do you diagonalize this thing? You know, what's actually happening here? And by the end, everyone's like, what did you, like, what did you actually do? Like, what did you prove? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is this physics? Yeah. I had a talk once. So this is back when I was doing uh, density functional theory. And I gave the talk. And, okay, density functional theory is the, the theory of, quote unquote density functionals and so i'd given this talk and then first question was well, what's a functional and i was like oh you didn't get anything from that talk i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah i just it's just you just out of you know like I, I i'm just like i showed you what i did and then like that's not what people want to see people want to like learn from what like you yeah. can't give this ridiculous technical talk because even even at conferences i, I, I never kind of e even at conferences yeah. you can't you can't do even if the conference is you know specialized you can't just jump into the rigorous technical details yeah yeah, yeah and i th maybe that's something i didn't appreciate until getting so far i guess uh is that like like everything's very, like there are serious specializations and you can just be in a slightly adjacent adjacent field and just yeah be like i don't know what this guy's talking about like 
it's yeah like, we need to we need to take this down and and so like going to yeah you need to really get good at catering to your audience and that's a whole science communication thing too so yeah there, there are definitely some physicists who, who are on like the very very mathy side in my field and to be honest mm-hmm. it's 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 a it's a pleasure and a chore to read their paper because sometimes it's very difficult for me to understand yeah. what they actually um did and what they actually proved um so so i would be if they if they did a talk and they just focused on the technical details i would be completely lost and i still wouldn't yeah <clears throat> um but uh you friend says the worst question is okay cool but why is that useful i get i got that question uh a lot you know if you have engineers in your life they're sort of the technical people that you can you can explain in more detail to them about what you're actually doing but then it's sort of like yeah but why is that useful and that's sort of like what they're programmed to ask i i've also gotten questions in my undergrad i did my the the theoretical physicists um uh all worked in the applied math department so if you want to do theoretical physics you're in the applied math department in your undergrad as well and I would tell people I'm doing applied mathematics and they'd be like, Oh, so you want to be a high school teacher? I was like, Oh, <laughs> not, not really to, to be honest. Um, yeah. Why is that useful? Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> I imagine they didn't think general relativity was useful when they first, uh, when they first discovered it, but like, uh, gen- yeah. it's when people say that I generally like to, um, I like to chat about sort of like understanding the universe for the sake of understanding it ends up having sort of benefits that you can't see. Like lots of NASA missions, for example, give lots of uh, side effects and and, and new technologies because people are tasked with solving uh, problems that no one has ever uh, been asked to solve. And then that always has unintended consequences. Um, And same same for theoretical understandings. Like we, we have technology that might have come out a hundred years or longer after something was uh, something was proved, but that technology relied on someone's work from a from from a century ago, right? So we don't we don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you'll say, and it's, oh, it, sorry. Yeah, oh. it's it's a building process in that like. Uh, well, I'm just saying it's a building process in that like even if they didn't rely directly on your work they still cited you and like they brought something from you know like it's it's everyone's building on this giant stack of work yeah and so yeah like saying uh, you can you can bring it all back to this fundamental science you know is oh what's what's the point of doing this like well maybe that end goal isn't the point but getting there we had to develop all this other stuff and you know it's it's about creating this web of 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 knowledge so that it's like Monte Carloing knowledge. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like if all of us do it, we're gonna find the good stuff, right? <laughs> the the funny thing is, when it comes to GR and quantum, people at least know what it is. Okay, this is good for astro stuff. Quantum stuff uh, is good for X Y Z. But a simple but not boring example for statmec isn't easy. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess that's kind of what comes to mind for you, Wyatt. What, a good example, like what's a, what's a nice example that immediately sort of comes to mind for why StatMech itself is... So, okay, so, so well, yeah, okay. I, I have an answer, but you, you can go first. Okay, uh, well, okay. I mean, StatMech, StatMech, so StatMech is so broad that okay we can we can talk about a lot of different things there i have kind of two ideas one of which is statmec is intimately connected with quantum information yep and quantum information like okay you're not going to watch a quantum information talk with someone say using the word quantum computer in it so if you want an application you know you need that broad base yep statmec if you want to talk about classical or quantum statmec the hottest topics are critical phenomena and that's people are really interested in critical phenomena and exotic materials and stuff like that and you need static to understand that kind of behavior so yeah uh you know it might not be you know the the, the sexiest but 
StatMech is used all the time for, yeah, or the foundations of StatMech are used in understanding, you know, a lot of its behavior. Like, uh, I don't know, you can get, you can get, you can argue whether or not some of these things are StatMech, but, you know, a lot of field, there's a lot of statistical field theories, which are built off of StatMech. And that's, you, you got to come from somewhere, you know, you, you, it's yeah i think yeah. there's a lot of ways you could you could draw that those lines yeah yes yeah. stat mech has this weird place where it's it's not really a physical theory what it really is is it gives you a nice way to approach uh problems in physics where if you just tried to use physical theories you would get nowhere so if you want to describe black yeah. holes, if you want to describe metals, like mm. ba basically echoing what Wyatt said, if, if you want, like, you're not going to be able to uh, understand, like, basic properties of metals. Like, this is like, if you open up a solid state physics textbook, right, this is often what they, what they sort of open with. The first, like, is is the Fermi Dirac distribution a result of of solid state physics, or, or is it a result of StatMech? It, it's a result of StatMech, right? Like, it's a, it, you're basically to, it's poly exclusion principle plus the grand canonical ensemble, and um, so I, I guess the thing that I like to tell people when I get attitudes uh, like that is that you know, all all of these um. Like all of these fields that have these really, really cool ideas and they pitch them to you, like a lot of them, StatMech is propping them up and is allowing them to say those things, right? Stat, StatMech yeah. is the hidden, hidden tool set that allows you to sort of talk about these things in a very, in, in a very accessible, like mathematically accessible uh, way. <laughs> You'll steal that? Yeah, that's a good, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a... I, I think, I, yeah, I thought yeah. about that a lot. I think that drawing that, you know, yeah, it's impossible to draw the line, I think, between quantum information, at least, and, and, and stat mech. Yep. For me, in my mind. Um, in, in my mind, too. Like, I, th I think some people will somehow see, like, the Boltzmann's entropy as um so somehow like they'll somehow think that that's like a thermodynamic entropy and then so and then they'll say like oh the von neumann entropy is like an informational entropy and in some sense yeah. that's fine but like it's really just like a maximization principle of the information to get to like one from from the other so for me i view stat mech as it, it's it, the foundations of stat mech is like an information yeah it's our arguments from information theory <clears throat> I think so I mean this might be a little bit of a tangent and I don't know if we want to go there but go there um I think one thing so one thing that we we don't necessarily do a great job of is is when you're learning about these basic models so like we, we always say oh here's the Ising model ha <laughs> ha like nothing actually works with the Ising model it doesn't do any like no there's nothing that's but we get into these when you start doing kind of really uh when you when you can you can look at higher like more complicated models but when you do things like like rg for example i don't know if you're ever going to talk about rg i i definitely will so, so, we, so just for the audience uh renormalization yeah. group yeah, is, is what he's talking about. Yeah, no, yeah, no worries. Um, Eventually, we'll get there. We're gonna do real yeah. space and K space. Ooh, yeah. So this K space is the. I mean, that's one of the most beautiful things ever. I think it's it's really nice. I love it. Um, <laughs> but you can show, right? You can show that there are models. You can be like, oh, here's an Ising model, and let's throw in some other interaction, and you can show that that interaction renormalizes out or becomes use an irrelevant term right and so you can show that there's all this huge class of models that are all just the and we don't I like for me i don't remember like ever seeing that ever seeing that like by the way like this all of the critical theory of this model you can throw in terms that renormalize away and don't matter yeah and yeah universality like that concept where you want to talk and universality that's that's i mean that's my biggest like i love it it's magic to me it's like like the yeah. idea of critical exponents and 
it's it, like scaling hypothesis and that's just like like how does the universe work this way and you can and there are real models of like for example the transverse fieldizing model was originally proposed as a model of i think some kind of like hydrogen fluoride or something like that it was it's like these things are are very real and if you can add terms to them and then show that they don't ultimately matter and so things kind of reduce a little bit again it's not exact but it's pretty good and so say you know i think that statistical mechanics really has its it's it's, it's you know it's hands and everything you you all says universality blew my mind at first i thought i misheard slash misread it uh, i can't it, it can't be this powerful <laughs> just can't but it is yeah, yeah i i swear i swear like a lot of results in in stat mech feel like that to me where it's just it's just so powerful and it's so simple it's just like well it actually turns out you can just study this one model and you get this whole class of models yeah. um yeah <clears throat> Absolutely. The thing that blew my mind was like, oh yeah, and by the way, all these exponents, they add up to two. <laughs> it's like, what? So oh why? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like because they have to. They just they just have you're to. Like, That's just the way it is. Yeah. It's the way the universe is. They just do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for sure. Universality is um is one of those things that. that I def I definitely wasn't expecting. When I went it when I went into um advanced stat mech, universality was not one of the things I was expecting to come out with, but it was definitely a pleasure to learn about it. Yeah. That's uh it's definitely so, Yeah. And something I wasn't expecting was also its its applicability like how you can step from just like the partition function and then go, you know, we've we've developed whatever this theory and then now we're gonna be talking about you know, okay, this is way down the road for you, but like when you're talking about renormalization group and you're talking about like a, a field theory, uh, it's like, oh, that's also just, this is what like the high energy physics people do. It's like, yeah, it's, a say, it's two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Which in my mind, I think I thought originally, like when I came out of, I don't know, maybe undergrad, I kind of I kind of put physics into boxes. I was like, oh, the condensed better people do this. And then the... The, the high energy people do this and then you, you kind of get deeper and deeper into this stuff and you're like oh no we all do everyone this, yeah everyone's right? talking about <laughs> a lot of the same concepts everyone's using a lot of the same tools that, that's one of the really interesting things mm -hmm. about the uh the video topic this weekend is scrambling and it's like right now there's a whole bunch of quantum info people working on it independently there's people in condensed matter physics and the thermalization community is talking about it independently and then also you have black hole, like high energy, like, you know, and black hole physicists, uh, et cetera. Like everyone is interested in this phenomena. Um, and it's just, yeah. I never expected to be reading papers from people writing about black holes at the same time as I was, as I was doing research in condensed matter physics. Yeah. I, I don't like, I remember reading about this like um this maldicina bound the um yep the, the black hole thing and it's like this is the this is the condition under which this condensed matter system is basically a black hole <laughs> and it's like what yeah <laughs> what does that mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's true that's very yeah exactly that that maldicina paper is yeah it's definitely, that's definitely a good one. It's a connection I didn't expect, but uh, what what bound again? So um, so Maldacena. It's one. Of, so at the end of my um, my video, I I show an article from uh, from Maldacena, and it's called a bound on chaos, and he shows that um, these things that measure scrambling called OTOX. Uh, can grow exponentially with a quantum Lyapunov exponent. Correct me if I'm misexplaining this, Wyatt. And he um, uh, he shows that that this Lyapunov exponent has a particular upper bound dependent on the temperature of the object that you're that you're interested in uh, uh, studying for scrambling. Um, 
So that that's that's basically so so the so the so the bound is basically upper bounding how how sort of fast this scrambling process can go, or not not how fast but sort of how thoroughly it can grow. I guess how fast, right? Yeah, how fast. It's an exponential e to the lambda t. Yeah, I guess that's fair. I guess that's fair. Yeah, fast is pr is probably appropriate. Um. So yeah, no, 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 no worries, Yule. I got, I, I mean, usually, usually the end slide is just like an outro. I don't usually, I, I understand why people turn the video off at that point, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Alejandro says, uh, what blew my mind was when I learned that path integrals are useful for both particle and stat mech, and you just had to use imaginary time instead. Yeah, that's something we've talked about before yeah. on the, the stream, how temperature and time is just... You, you just yeah. you just yeah you, you can jump between them by uh by a simple substitution like that by just making time imaginary and yeah. then if you want to go from classical to quantum you just add a dimension yep i'm i'm currently i'm currently working on an algorithm called mets and it's called and they're ba it's it's called uh minimally entangled thermal states and it's a monte carlo algorithm where you basically time evolve uh uh, product states but instead of like actually time evolving them you evolve them in imaginary time and then you sample them and then that gets gives you back uh, you sample them and take expectation values of whatever you're interested in once you get to the temperature you want and that gives you back um uh the thermal uh you know thermal mm -hmm. average that you're that you're interested in so it's like a very so yeah, all, all like these, even for even for little numerical methods that you'd be using to try and time evolve things, uh, those can be absolutely thrown at um, uh, thermal problems as well. Very, uh, very, you know, in very sophisticated ways to get out uh, uh, very interesting uh, answers. Yeah, there's some very interesting deep connections there that are really really wild, and they just show up everywhere. And that, that that kind of blew my mind too. And it's it's <laughs> it's cool that you can use them to to actually calculate things. <laughs> it's it's also cool. And I think I think coming you know wheeling back to uh, Yule's question about like how do you communicate these things to to sort of lay people. One of the things that you need to communicate is just like I I'm sitting here and I'm super excited to have this conversation and share these share these interesting insights. Uh, and like you sort of have to communicate your passion uh, to these people because people can feed off of that uh, that in your explanations when you're super excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So so why? Yeah. What? Oh, sorry. Did you, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh no no no. Go ahead. So. Um, so I've worked in, I, I, I guess I've worked on, in, in terms of styles, like sort of three different uh, sort of, I don't want to call them supervisory style, but maybe project styles in terms of how projects are are structured. Um, and one thing that I find very interesting to, to ask people is, you know, what does the lifetime of a project for your research look like from like the conception of, I want to ask this question or even before that, how do you get to the point where you have a question you want to ask um, and you know that you can potentially answer it and then getting all the way to being uh, sort of paper ready uh, to, to write a paper, post on the archive, etc. Yeah, so, I mean, these are tough. It's, a, it's tough to answer in that kind of, format because that sometimes i guess assumes that you start with the question you want to ask and that's not necessarily always true like for example when i started like the only reason i started working on light cones i guess which we haven't really mentioned but yeah we haven't um, mentioned those yet uh, well, but uh yeah but uh basically like this otox scrambling stuff was was you know i was working on caustics in some other area and then my collaborator jesse just walked into my office was like, look, you can do this with the transfer field Isaac model and just like writes down the quasi particle propagator yep. and says, look, it makes a caustic. And uh, like what he originally wrote down was 
So, so I, I, but... I guess, uh, I guess, uh, just for the audience, if you've seen the Anderson localization um, video, the lambda is equal to zero uh, case when there's no disorder. Is that a good example of what they what they might be thinking of when they talk about caustics? Or is that? Uh, do, do you need yeah, to... yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I think actually Josh had a comment on the video, right? Yeah, that, he pointed that it talked out. about it. Do you have? I think so. That was the XX mod, right? Uh, yeah. Well, it's transformed into fermions. Yep. It's the single right. particle propagator, so though. I... It's 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 your it's your yeah. model just with um. A, a, yeah, it's XX versus Ising. It's not yeah. Ising. Yeah. So I, it's a really good picture. I think some subtleties between the. Uh, I think it's pretty good. Is the answer? I think the XX might be very. Simple, but I think I think it actually might be really good. So you find that near the edges you have this kind of highest peak and then these lower peaks. Yep. And those edges are caustics. So if you were to zoom way out, they would look like really bright patches going like this. Yes. Uh, in like space time. So imagine uh, this is time, this is space. You have two bright patches going like that. And then if you zoom yeah, in a little so bit, you I'll see do, that they're I'll, actually wavy. I'll do it for you because you're kind of pixelated. So you got you got, oh, sorry, you, got sorry. you got space, and then you got time on the y-axis, is what you said. Yeah. Yep. And then you and then so 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 the the whole picture sort of propagates out in a cone uh, like this, which which happens to something that's very interesting. It's called a butterfly velocity. So it, so it propagates out at yeah. that at that rate. But hey, sorry, go on. And then on, so on the edge of that cone is is the caustic because that's where, as it turns out, these trajectories like to pile up. And then what you can do is you can basically describe some local universal behaviors of that cone using catastrophe theory by writing it as a catastrophe. In terms of, in this case, it's a fold catastrophe is what it's called, but you can get higher order ones. I've got a paper on that. Um, and then, so so the local description is 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 you can just say it's an airy function mm -hmm. um, because it has to it has to follow these rules basically that we we uh, we set out by the coalescing of critical points and and so yeah that picture that you have for interest in localization you have these waves moving out and those are airy functions basically moving across in in space time. Um, yeah, so it's a good, it's actually a really good picture. I forgot about that picture that you made. It's okay in that video. So we we demand that guests on this show should be experts on all videos made yeah. on <laughs> LTA. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, sorry, okay, so, sorry. We, we At minute so, thirteen of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want yeah, I want precise uh precise uh you know timestamps. Yeah. Um. Sorry, where where were we before I interjected there? So you were talking about, so oh sorry, the lifetime of a project. You were saying, uh, you know, so, sometimes you don't actually start with an individual question. You just sort of like, you you were going into, yeah, that, into just, that direction. You kind of start exploring, and you say, you know, we for, so for this is for us. This is how we kind of do it because, um, this is just how it has happened. Uh, so. Like for example, that project, Jesse walked in and he said, "Hey, you can do this with this model." And then I kind of thought about it and looked into different models, and and then I kind of came on this world of light cones and what people studied uh, in, in these um, in these types of systems. And then we realized, oh, you can apply this 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 theory that's. Uh, is usually applied in optics in this case, and no one's really talked about that. And so let's see what things we can predict with this. And so we ended up predicting some scaling exponents and stuff like that. Yep. Um, but um, in terms of the lifetime, that's one way of if you just kind of stumble into a an idea, and then these you can kind of take a couple of different ideas and put them together, and say, okay, now now I've I've got a kind of kind of surface level understanding of this 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 concept and then i can start asking the question and answer it and so at some point you've already written a bunch and then you start asking more detailed questions so i'm not necessarily certain that the question comes out right away 
that's interesting. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's the impression that I got, which, which is why I think that um, your your group is so sort of interesting that way because you just sort of start making connections from things that you're um, that you're interested in, and then and then sort of like a question emerges that you've answered yeah. or you've almost answered. Yeah, my supervisor really likes to. That his thing is like really making connections, and he wants to kind of make connections and see what we can. See, when we make these connections, what else can we, you know, can we make something greater than the sum of the parts of these, mm -hmm. these connections? And that's sometimes very useful. Um, another thing, another project we had, it's a, kind of on the back burner, but it's, we've got, you know, some basic theory of, of Bose-Einstein condensates undergoing some phase transition. Can we apply catastrophe theory in this case to show that some scaling exponents from um, basically statmec and from catastrophe theory are are related. Yep. And you know where does does one come from the other? That's an interesting question. But that's that's something you answer once you kind of get there. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that the question always starts the project. That's that's really that's definitely really interesting because I mean in terms of like three different because who you're collaborating with sort of dictates what your sort of project it's sort of like a mix and mash of what your uh, different styles are um and uh and, and you know in my undergrad it was like um and i guess i can't speak to to marcus's style completely but on our project it was sort of like actually i think we can do more here and i have questions that weren't completely answered um so let's see what happens, and then perhaps something will 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 come of this, and we can improve upon this. Uh, with Eric, it's a lot of sort of like, here's a question, and because we're computational physicists, it's sort of like we're gonna throw everything, like we're we're just gonna throw co computational resources at this, and we'll get something out of it. And, and sometimes that that's gonna end up like um, we will have analytical results after um we do the computational bit and sometimes that means uh we ask uh Wyatt Kirkby to do some analytics for us and uh so sometimes that means uh sometimes that means we just don't have um an analytical answer and, and, and we just sort of throw it out to the world and then uh with Alvado um we sort of had this like like together um we had this like Monte Carlo uh type approach where it just seemed like we were we were really looking for something to work on together, and for a long time it was just sort of can we answer this question? No. Can we answer this question? No. Can we answer this question? Oh, maybe. And then it turns out no, um, and, and and sort of like that. And then finally something sticks, um, and then and then you go from there. So yeah. so it was like I I I kind of feel like there are three different approaches, and like perhaps there's yeah. it's probably like a con like a continuous spectrum of, of approaches, but but I find Duncan's. Duncan and your your uh, your group's approach uh, to be very interesting. Do you think that's yeah, rubbed up rub, rubbed, rubbed up on, on you? And, oh, sorry, sorry, go on. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I think there's certainly so with with so with different approaches. I, I I would say that some of them you have to be you have to be careful with some of them, right? Because you can if you. It, if you keep, if you if you don't, um, sometimes you can ask a question and be like firm on, on answering that question, and then it might be a very very difficult question to answer. You never get to the solution. Yes. Or with our approach, it's like, you know, we're basically looking for interesting things, and when one shows up, we try to see if we can make something, you know, tease some questions out of it. But there's sometimes there just isn't, and there there are honestly some projects that I don't necessarily have faith in, um, that may have had too much life in them. I don't know. It's I mean it's an honest part of of, of research, and that 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 happens. Yeah, sometimes so you have to be, be careful. Open sometimes. Open. Yeah, there's always like a publisher perish sort of mentality in the back of your mind of like I need to be, especially as a grad student, you want to be. You want yeah, to be absolutely. you want to be padding your resume and making sure you get papers out there and uh, and stuff like that and getting stuck on a problem for a very long time can be uh, can can be anxiety inducing yeah. to say the least. But like my, you know, when I was in my undergrad, my 
my supervisor's approach was like polar opposite, right? He was, you know, he found this paper from the seventies. He's like, we can do this with a different model. Here it is. Let's go. <laughs> and then we got it like, here, you do this calculation. You do and It was like, okay, let's bang these out. Like, <laughs> and then that it was, you know, it was not a, by no, it was by no means a, a groundbreaking paper, but it was a solid paper in its own right. Yeah, and, and papers like and that are necessary because yeah. it happened to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pa papers like that are necessary. They also teach you techniques. Sometimes I find I find that a really nice introduction for people into the field is something uh, like that because it teaches them. I mean, you you got to learn density functional theory, right? And you got to be you got to familiarize yourself with a particular type of model. And then you get a paper out of it, which is actually, you know, a, a result that shows nothing surprising and everything we expected to happen, even though we didn't have like, um, we hadn't cataloged it yet. That's still a result and that's still necessary to sort of, you know, yeah, yeah get, get a, you know, uh, check another box off the list of things that we should be asking. And it's unfortunate that academia really kind of doesn't really, you know, it, li it likes the flashy stuff, right? So you're never going to get that into a, a PRX or a, a nature, but you're gonna, which, which is, you know, it's that, that could, the problem with academia is a whole yeah. YouTube channels worth of <laughs> <laughs> videos. So maybe we don't want to get into that. <laughs> yeah, that's for yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a few problems, but uh, so so, <laughs> so we've gone on for uh, about an hour here. The chat, uh, unless does anyone else, uh, if you're in the chat, uh, any any final questions that uh, you want to ask before we sort of sign off here? Give you a, a few seconds. It was, it was definitely it was definitely a great chat. I think it was a it was a really fun chat. Yeah. And your and your video quality so held here. up a lot more consistently than I uh, I expected. About the last topic. Um. So while so while Alejandro uh, perhaps types up uh, what he uh, what he wants to ask, next next week we'll be doing I think why it's going to return. We're going to do a fun stream. Uh, I I think the streams will eventually. Um, we'll eventually uh, sort of make them completely separate from the video. You can still ask about the video topic if you want, but just to get more uh, more people that potentially aren't related to what the videos uh, the video of the week was about uh, on the show, uh, just have more chats and stuff like that. Maybe do some fun stuff. So so next week we're gonna have uh, James Lambert back probably. And why it's going to come, and we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna rank some uh, physics equations and talk about uh, why we think certain equations are are cool and why others aren't as impactful as others. So Alejandro asks, how would you deal with a problematic advisor? I mean, a supervisor that keeps you in a doomed project. So that's a that's honestly a tough one. I I think. So, so before that happens, so if perhaps I should make a video about this, I've, and perhaps people in the chat can tell me if they'd actually be interested in this video. Cause I, I, I've been thinking about like, you know, tips to interview grad supervisors and like pick grad school, pick projects, uh, et cetera. So before you get into that situation, and I hope you're not, I hope you're not in that situation. Um, when you go in and you interview people, um, you're interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. Um, and you should definitely be speaking to their graduate students and other graduate students in the department uh, to sort of get a feel for how a particular person is as a supervisor. Um, uh, because you're going to be spending years of your life with this person, potentially, if you're going to do a PhD with them, right? So you should have a connection with them. Supervisors can absolutely kill your love for physics. PhD is a grind um, and everyone comes in very passionate and excited about it, of course, but a bad working relationship with your boss in any industry, in any type of job is always, uh, always difficult. Um, so 
Now, Wyatt, what would you say about uh, a problematic advisor sort of sticking you into a doomed project? Um, <clears throat> okay, so okay, okay, so let, let's assume that you are in that situation now. Yes. Um, then I think so. There's a couple things that need to happen. I think it, it really depends on first of all on your relationship with your supervisor. At, at some point, so first of all, if, if you have a like halfway decent relationship with your supervisor, you should at least be able to kind of, I, it's tough. It's certainly tough to have this conversation, but sometimes you have to say, ha, sit down and have an honest conversation and say, look, like I know that you think that this project is going to work, but I'm concerned for my, and like maybe it will work, but I'm concerned for the fact that this is going to seriously impact my career because like they might not see it and i think this is a blind spot among supervisors is that this is a project in their long line of projects that they have had whereas you know this is a the, the phd is like a turning point in that if things don't go well it can things can snowball right yeah. and so i think that having the conversation like just and like I said, it can be very, very tough to start this conversation, but say like, ask the supervisor to empathize and say, look, from my perspective, this is seriously damaging to my ability to graduate, to get any kind of postdoc or to be taken seriously at any job interview afterwards, because this is where the career formation starts. If you don't have a good relationship with your supervisor, then you might have to there's other reasons for that, but you might have to go to uh, a, an, an advisor that you have, like a, a grad chair or something like that, and ask ask them how to approach this very difficult situation. Because it might end up that you are stuck in a situation where you can might it might be just better to change supervisors. Like yeah. I know more than one people who've changed supervisors in their third year of their PhD that's like that's hard to do but as they kind of weighed the options and said i have to do it like these yeah. projects are not working so it's it's a really tough situation but the first step would be i guess be honest with the supervisor and say i don't see this going anywhere and i'm concerned for my own graduation because it looks bad on them to not graduate a student so even if they don't care about you they should at least care that they're not getting their graduate, their students graduating with any kind of good projects or papers out there. Uh, Alejandro says, it was for my master's, but I was in that situation and it's been really hard for me to be accepted into a PhD now. I'm, I'm, really, I'm, really, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes, and this is such a sad reality about the way everything is structured, sometimes your supervisor like the like the power dynamic between you and your supervisor is just it's just not balanced at all and a bad supervisor can really you know affect your future in a very in a very real way I, i'm really sorry to hear that uh you're having difficulty getting yeah. accepted into, into phd programs now and uh, yule says wow in their in their th uh in their third year that's brave yeah it's it's brave but it's also like there's some like it's it's you know i guess sometimes not doing it can almost seem like a sunk cost fallacy because sometimes you just need to you need to switch if you actually want to get real value um out of your degree if so like to, to be honest i've fortunately never i've been in projects that i didn't think were going anywhere i stuck with them as my supervisor insisted that i uh, that i uh, stuck with them but eventually i just said listen I don't know why this isn't working, um, and I have I have better things like I have other things that I want to do. And sometimes people aren't in the situation where they can. Sometimes the supervisor won't accept, yeah, something like that. And then and then you just need to say, unfortunately, this is not a good use of my time, right? Like it is, it, yeah. That's a really tough conversation to start. And so I can see why people, especially a master's student, would have major, like, like you said, like the power dynamic is not symmetrical. So yeah, it, it's there's no fault in having 
hesitancy in starting that conversation. Yeah. But, during, during my master's degree, there's no way that I would feel confident to tell my supervisor, hey, I don't think that this is, A, I don't think this is working, and B, I think I think there's other interesting questions that I could answer anyway. So, like, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. This is just wasting my time. As a master's degree student, you can't say stuff like, like, because you don't know, you don't know enough, right? Like, you're relying, you're relying on this expert to give you uh, questions to answer that are, A, within your ability, uh, and B um, are actually answerable questions, right? And not not every we we don't have the tools to answer every question, and so and sometimes questions that seem simple to the supervisors end up not being questions that a grad student or even someone beyond that, uh, even an expert in the field, uh, uh, can answer. Yeah. So it's a tough situation. I'm really I'm really I'm really sorry uh, to to hear that. Physics, I think physics loses a lot of very talented and very uh, passionate people to this problem, to be honest. It's sort of a, it's sort of, I feel very lucky to be with my supervisor. It's sort of the luck of the draw, almost, uh, in some sense, to get a good supervisor. What, uh, wait, what, what was that like going in? Like, what did you know about Duncan when you accepted? Did you get the impression that Duncan was a good supervisor, or... Um, yeah, uh, like when I, so I actually didn't, um, know I was going to meet with Duncan when I accepted, uh, I just happened like we, so when we did the, at, at McMaster, we did the meet and greet, right? So when you show up in the morning and then you meet with like 10 people and then Duncan was one of the last people I met with and he, he's, he's really good at getting you to, to, to like be interested in his work. He's like quite the... I don't know, orator, physics salesman. I don't know what to, to, to call it, but it's it was it was captivating. And I remember like thinking about it because I was pretty sure I was going to go somewhere else. And then I thought, you know what? This like he seemed good, and he seemed very like I was into the casual nature of his. You know, like there's some people who are very incredibly rigid, and I kind of wanted to steer clear of that. And that's one thing that I got from uh, having a conversation with grad students. Because, you know, spoiler alert, if you have lunch or whatever with grad students who are in the department, you get the actual honest answers about like, yeah, maybe you don't want to do a project with this person uh, because, you know, the students quit half the time. So, yeah. um, but the impression I got from Duncan was very good and very kind of like not crazy like pressure just like very casual very interested in this like awesome looking project that he had his in his, his mind and then i thought like yeah it seems like a good fit i thought i was going to go to uh uvic and work on uh work with a prof who worked on work with d-wave systems actually oh yeah oh, okay that's interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't know that and then uh, last minute, I changed my mind. <laughs> Duncan, Duncan's, Duncan's great. I I, yeah. I really enjoy meeting. Uh, yeah. Duncan is also on this paper that uh, Wyatt and I are writing together, and he's always a he's always a, f a fun person uh, uh, to yeah. chat with. He knows a lot about a lot of different topics, and he'll. It's really good, and that's what makes his his research like. This is why he kind of focuses on his research ends up being like. Let's take a little of this and a little of this and then see what comes out because he knows like he did his PhD. He yeah, he did his um, PhD with Michael Berry. And so like Michael Berry is he, he's like one of the guys, right? He knows he knows asymptotics and optics inside and out quantum mechanics inside and out. And so Duncan through I guess through that experience and through meeting a lot of other people has a huge background of oh, you know. liam just showed up in the oh yeah yeah hi liam <laughs> he says you missed all the duncan secrets uh, um, i'll ask duncan he'll, uh, he'll tell you <laughs> if you could choose another area in physics uh what would you choose of course it has to be completely different than what you're doing right now hmm completely different than what i'm doing right now i i think i think one of the things that i think is really fun is working on numerical algorithms 
I really like thinking about how to make things efficient and more accurate. I loved numerical analysis when I was uh, when I was an undergrad. I, um, but the problem with that statement is I'm technically still doing I'm doing that right now because I'm a computational physicist. I'm just not thinking <laughs> I'm not thinking super hard about how good the algorithm actually is and how I can improve it. I guess. What it's else? Not completely would... different at all. <laughs> <laughs> What would I do? I would switch to ultra cold atomic uh, gases, and then I'd work on thermalization problems. Wait, that's not different at all either. <laughs> um, I don't know why. Do you have a good answer? Uh, <clears throat> I probably wouldn't have given this answer until like my PhD, basically. But working in a lab doing ultra cold mm. atomic physics, like because ultra cold atoms and ultra cold ions are some of the best probes of fundamental physics that you can get yeah uh, and it's it's really incredible what they can do with them um other than that i mean i really like superconductivity it's a very kind of cliche answer but it's 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 really cool and and, and you know interesting topics i was also thinking about working with kind of the one of the canadian leaders of superconductivity jules carbot who passed away a few years ago but uh one of the i think he kind of came up with ellie ashberg theory um but yeah that's a cool topic and just i like stat making things which isn't really what i do but i like those things now so maybe that's <laughs> kind of self-fulfilling yeah the, the 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 problem for me is that I just I I'm I'm gonna throw it out there I don't really like computing integrals I don't find it rewarding and I feel like that rules out a large class of physics uh, <laughs> for, for I really like linear yeah. algebra problems to be honest <clears throat> um, some integ some integration is fine but I like sometimes when I look at uh, there, there's a researcher named Cliff Burgess uh, at McMaster, and sometimes when I look at like what they're doing on a daily basis, I just don't think I I, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, it just doesn't. I I feel I feel like you should simultaneously be interested in the questions you're answering, and you should simultaneously at, at the very least somewhat enjoy the grind to answer those questions. So actually being interested in, or at least not minding, uh, like the type of math you're doing. Yeah, you you should definitely take an ultra cold atom lecture. Um, <laughs> oh, you don't have time. That's funny. It is. It is so. It is so 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 interesting. Like all of the experimental evidence uh, in my field, or at least the vast majority of it, comes out of that field. It, it is at the very. I don't know, like, it's just, it's almost like mastering nature in some sense. Like, you're just... Yeah. There's so much you can do with them. And it's like, yeah, all these, we talk about spins all the time, but it's 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 always like, it's always an atom transitions between two states, hyperfine states of some atom. And yeah, they put them in chains. And there's this group in Waterloo that does this incredible thing with phonons in that they can, they, they line up a bunch of atoms or ions in, in this case, and they uh, they can get all kinds of interactions by by having the phonons uh, cancel out in just the right right way, and it's it's like it's so crazy how they control these things. But it's it's just a bunch of atoms in an array, and they're like, "What do you want me to simulate? I'll do anything." And then they they can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy. It, yeah, it's crazy. Like these um. These localized systems, for example, all, all, I'm pretty sure every, maybe not every example that I gave for experimental evidence, but recent experimental evidence for something called many body localization uh, came out of cold atom uh, experiments. It is like, I cannot, I, I wish I had the opportunity to take a course on cold. If I had the opportunity, I would take it. I have a textbook behind me that I bought with the full intention of reading about them and admittedly i have not yet but it's a you know it's constantly in the back of my mind that i should be uh i should be reading uh i should be reading those things that's half the textbooks on every physicist shelf i'll i'll get to it it's it's, it's what's there. what's eating away at you right now what's uh what sh what should you be reading right now should i oh i started reading this 
singular optics book, but that's more important for, that's actually important for my research and it's highly relevant. I, I have a quantum optics book that I should be reading. And then I am kind of interested in learning group theory properly. So I've got a group theory textbook that I kind of want to read. Nice, nice. I have this, I have this, uh, I don't I don't know if it's gonna blur it. Maybe it's gonna blur it. Is that one? It's um, it's called uh, Operator Algebras and Quantum Statistical Mechanics 1. There's also a part two. And it's written by uh, Bratelli and Robinson, like Lee Robinson. Mm. And it's uh, it's all about like C star and W star algebras and like, and, and, and those types of things and getting into like uh, KMS states. Uh, you know, really, really rigorously thinking about how you go to like the thermodynamic limit um, on like finite hill, like, you know, constructing it out of finite Hilbert spaces uh, locally and stuff like that. Do, uh, what's a good cold Adams textbook? The one that I have, which is what uh, Ryan Plested recommended to me, is... It's called uh, Bose-Einstein condens condensation in dilute gases. Oh, is that Pethick and Smith? Yeah, and I think there's a second yeah. one. But Liam, yeah, I, ha I have classic. to admit, you should probably you should probably ask Duncan. <laughs> yeah. Pethick and Smith is a classic, and then um, ah, goodness, I, I can't remember now. There's one but, other uh, one. That one's yeah, yeah. There's another good one. Goodness. Yule, Yule says, dude you, know this. dude, you have no many idea how many books I bought from the library because uh, they were almost destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually, Pethick and Smith is sitting on a table out there as well. It's, it's like <laughs> a few chapters in and then stopped. Your name is, Liam, your name is Floman Physics. I can't click on your name here. Are, do, you, do you make YouTube videos? That's a very nice, uh, that's a very nice little uh, YouTube uh, YouTube name you got there. Floman Physics. You have both of those? Yeah, th those are the ones I think Ryan Plested and Duncan recommended to me. Also, a quantum optics one by Leon Hart. Duncan always yeah. recommends. Oh, Leon Hart. He's he's big on the quantum catastrophe stuff, so I see. He did it in the context of black holes and hmm. actually Liam knows a fair bit about it. I think. Nice SpongeBob related profile pic, yeah. Yeah, I have I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of books on my I also I also have uh I also have a I I wanted to learn quantum field theory more thoroughly. So I have Mark Srednicki's uh textbook. And I oh have, yeah, that's a very conversational one. I I don't have uh, I haven't I haven't done it yet. When can you do it? Right? It's like yeah, I'm I'm doing like uh, I'm spending most of my working hours actually working, and then I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I fortunately had uh, I mean I had uh, Altland. Well, I had Nagaosa, but basically Altland and Simons for um my comps which is a condensed matter field theory book so by the end of my comprehensive exam i even though i don't really do much field theory at all my condensed matter field theory was actually good enough to be like oh i understand hmm. a bunch of phenomena from this perspective and i thought it was i mean i just i i really like it i enjoy it very much so altland and simons is a really good book but it's also very thick Alejandro says, what do you think of the price of physics literature? Are you talking about books or are you talking about uh, articles? If you're talking about books, I think, yeah, I, I have to say I bought my first non-physics book like yesterday uh, that I have bought in a while. And I was like, this is going to be like $100, $150, right? Because that's just how much books cost. But it was like $40. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's like it's like the same amount of like pages and I, I as 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 like a textbook would be I, I don't I don't know how I feel yeah about, about it I mean it's really expensive it is very expensive you can do things like you can get for for at least the basic textbooks you know your undergrad textbooks you can do you could there's ways you can get hit your hands on for example the economy editions that are for sale outside of the u.s or north america 
and you can get like these off-brand versions of Griffiths Quantum or Griffiths CNM or all these other ones. But be warned, <laughs> they're not great quality. You know, I had a copy of Griffiths that had like chapter four, I think, just had like a like 10 pages of chapter six, just like inserted in it. And just like, it was very confusing because you went from one page to the next and it was like, all of a sudden chapter six and you're like, what? <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah and then it went back to chapter four again it was really i i had a prof in undergrad who tried to get around this by um writing his like it was like he must have put this together in less than a month he put together a whole booklet um it wasn't formatted correctly so some of the pages were actually like diagonally printed somehow oh no and like there were a bunch of mathematical errors and stuff like that like i don't know it, it's it's really unfortunate because like a lot of these books they print them knowing that you have to buy them so you like if, if it's in a class a lot of profs a lot of profs will structure it in such a way that you can go off the lecture notes but the lecture notes are often insufficient to learn the material so you end up having to buy these books anyways. I I had a prof that be, would be like, oh, here's a recommended book, but like you don't have to buy it. And then his lecture notes were more or less like rephrasing every <laughs> every paragraph in that in that book. That was my, you know, for condensed matter course. It was basically Ashcroft and Merman, but like rephrased you're like I, you just took like in the exact order but used like the thesaurus and just like <laughs> yeah i I don't, I don't know how common this is at different uh, universities but at our university and in other universities in southern ontario um they have deals with springer for example and you can get so-called uh, my copies of different books that are um uh soft covers and then they're they're usually like tw i think they're like what like 20 20 40 40 dollars they're significantly less than the actual like if you bought it uh through any other service even if it was soft cover it'd be like four or five times the cost so all of my i structured my comprehensive exams in such a way that all of them were uh all of them were available that way that's real smart yeah but um yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But so, we, so we've got about half an hour. I hate when props do that. Sometimes even citing word for word explanations out of a book. Yeah, departments can cycle props around, and then profs are also primarily. I mean, they they you know they probably feel like their primary role is a uh, a res is research a lot of the time. But um, so we're about we're about half an hour over time here. Thank you, Wyatt, for sticking uh, half an hour over time. But I think we're. I think we're gonna wrap up the um, the stream here. I had a lot of fun. Hopefully, we can have you back. Uh, maybe I mean more more than more more than once. I guess. Yeah, that'll be great. Hopefully, uh, next time my internet's a little less choppy. I don't know how it is on that end, so we'll see when the YouTube video goes up. But uh, the, the the last like half and all of the overtime, it was good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it was the, the main time slot you're supposed to be here is bad. <laughs> but uh, so. Oh so wrapping up the stream uh have a good night to everyone if it's not night have a good whatever's going on have a good day um and uh thanks so much for showing up to the stream and asking questions and, and hanging out with us uh we, we will or i will see you next week yeah def definitely liam catch up on the <laughs> yeah let, let, let me know at a later date what you think about the uh videos and uh yeah see you all and see, and see uh, Alejandro. All right, so we are...